Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Talk Sarcoidosis. I'm your host, Dorothea Howard, and in the studio today, I have once again, Dr. Edward Chen from the Johns Hopkins Sarcoidosis Clinic. How are you today, Dr. Chen? Oh, very good. Thanks for having me back on the show. <laughs> Thanks for being here. And you know, Dr. Chen, we all know that the summer is about to wind down now. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I think this is, uh, uh, as you said, we, it, it's been a, a reasonably hot summer as usual. We've had, had a, uh, plenty of, our share of, um, of hot days. It's a good opportunity to kind of like um, remind everyone or encourage everyone to try to find opportunities, go outside, send, spend some si time outside, particularly before winter chases us back indoors. You know, um, Dr. Chen, I love this time of the year, especially when it's fall and you get a chance to go out and people with sarcoidosis, including myself, you know, we like to find different opportunities to go out and maybe walk or hike, as I was <laughs> mentioning to you before we started taping. Yeah. But there are some people who are unable to do that. So, I mean, what do you think about um, how they can easily get up and down in this situation? Right. Well, you know, I, I think one thing uh, we certainly try to uh, talk to our patients about uh, would be, uh, like you mentioned, it, it is important to uh, maintain healthy lifestyle, you know. So we know that a lot of our patients, uh, they come in the clinic, talk about how they've been uh, paying attention to their diet, counting calories, and, and eating healthily. But we also have to, you know, um, an important part of a healthy lifestyle would be, you know, physical activity too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, although we may ask our patients or remind them that it would be good to try to find opportunities to go out, be more active, to exercise. Um, you know, for some of our, our patients, particularly if they're not feeling well, they may not seem to have like maybe the motivation or, you know, to, to go out and exercise. Um, and I can understand that because as a patient myself, yeah. um, I would find it hard to be motivated to go out and do exercise or even indoors for exercise. But then on the other hand, you know, you feel like you're stuck, but then you know you really should be doing something. Right. And that's the problem, I think, with a lot of patients who have the disease. We just don't know where to, where to start. Right. So, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's sometimes hard um, or, or not as straightforward uh, for many of our patients. I mean, and, and maybe it's not fair to, you know, for us to simply ask pa our patients to, to exercise. I mean, I think most patients understand exercise is important. Um, and, uh, but, but again, like you're, you had mentioned before, you know, if they're not feeling well, and if, particularly if they've become less active right. um, and found to have active sarcoidosis, they, they do find themselves in situations where it's, it's, it's not easy for them to, to exercise. It may not necessarily be that they don't want to. Right. So how can patients keep from becoming too demoralized and it seems like our heart is in the right place to exercise, but then our body is not giving us the energy that we need yeah. to, to, you know, to start exercising. Right. Well, maybe another way to look at this would be to kind of, uh, uh, at least for, from, from my point, uh, to, to try to think about what the patients might be experiencing. So uh, like patients with, with, other types of uh, lung disease, mm -hmm. you know, people, um, and patients who happen to have pulmonary sarcoidosis, yet we know that a lot of them just simply aren't feeling very well, you know, and so if they're not feeling well, um, you know, there's, there's often a, a natural tendency to kind of hold back, you know, slow down, essentially avoid activities that might make them uh, short of breath, you know, make them feel even worse. And so what we, you know, what probably might be happening um, is that as patients become less active and maybe even stop exercising if they were exercising before, uh, they essentially, they'll, they'll experience deconditioning. And it's just a fancy word for meaning uh, the muscles become uh, less efficient and mm -hmm. out of shape. And, you know, as they, uh, as they stay less active and become more out of shape, um, they'll essentially will then experience more and more shortness of breath 
even with lower levels of activity. Um, and you know, this often is, uh, will create a situation, uh, maybe like a, a vicious cycle of deterioration. Um, so for, uh, you know, for, for, for a lot of patients, it's, it's, it's important to recognize that even though they may have lung disease, certainly as the main problem, that deconditioning is, is, is also really important as well. So, I mean, for having sarcoidosis, if, as if that's not a problem, right. you know, um, enough of a problem, I should say, how can patients do better? Right. Well, you know, we, we, again, we, we, as we've mentioned before, it, it is important uh, to recognize that in addition to the lung disease that mm -hmm. people do become out of shape, not necessarily willingly, but that's sort of part of, you know, what may happen when you become, uh, you know, when you, when you become sick, not feel well, and become less active. And so, you know, if they're not having any, um, if they're not really making any um, progress with trying to exercise on their own, right? you know, for some patients, what they probably need to do is think about joining an exercise program. Okay. Yeah. Really? <laughs> an, <laughs> yeah. a, an exercise program? Right. <laughs> so is it safe for patients with, you know, lung disease, and well, especially a bad lung disease like sarcoidosis, to actually join a gym? Right. Well, maybe we can put it this way. Um, you know, for, I mean, we, we know that most, we, we want to try to encourage physical activity, uh, particularly exercise, if we want to give it a word, um, uh, you know, for our patients. You know, for most patients, it, it probably is safe for them to, to exercise. But, you know, particularly, you know, in situations, for patients who have moderate to severe pulmonary sarcoidosis, and particularly if they're trying to start exercising, for, you know, from, from scratch, it probably would be a good idea to see if, if there's a way to kind of monitor and coach these patients as they start their, you know, um, start their efforts to exercise. And so this may be an opportunity to think of something called pulmonary rehabilitation to serve this role. So I've heard of that. So can you tell the viewers exactly what pulmonary rehabilitation is? Yeah. So pulmonary rehabilitation, this is a, um, a name given to a special physical therapy program that's designed to help patients with, you know, moderate to severe um, lung disease, like including sarcoidosis. Um, so pulmonary rehabilitation, um, these programs um, offer an opportunity uh, for certainly for patients to be monitored, you know, watch closely with cardiac mm -hmm. monitoring and oxygen measurements as they start to exercise. But pulmonary rehabilitation also provides a chance, an opportunity, not just for patients to exercise and get into better shape, uh, but also, you know, a chance for patients to essentially learn how to take better care of their, their lung disease. And what we mean by that is, um, you know, it's an opportunity to, uh, for patients to kind of learn how chronic lung disease causes symptoms and essentially um, affects, um, affect many different parts of their daily activities. Uh, maybe to learn how to recognize if there's a change in their health status. Uh, maybe implement a, uh, um, you know, an, an action plan, if that's something they've discussed with their regular doctor. Um, and then also, uh, probably have me uh, offer a chance for certain types of, uh, you know, social interaction, social support, not just from uh, the pulmonary rehab staff, but also just meeting other patients with chronic lung disease. Um, and so overall, you know, this is, uh, would be, uh, an um, pulmonary rehabilitation would provide essentially an environment that uh, hopefully can enhance the long-term maintenance of a lot of these um, health-promoting lifestyle changes that we are encouraging for most of our patients um, through sort of like the combination of exercise, um, education, and, and engagement. And you know, I've, I've heard of it, as I said before, and one of my fellow Sarkadonians, mm -hmm. she actually went through um, pulmonary rehabilitation before she had a lung transplant. Oh, yes. Um, but it sounds like a great program, definitely. So is it really, really um, beneficial for pulmonary sarcoidosis <laughs> patients to go through that program? Because it sounds like it is. Sure. No, I, I, I would say that most patients who um, go through pulmonary rehabilitation do um, ex you know, have some benefits from it. Um, again, it's, it's, it's both, it's meant to give an opportunity for people to get into better shape, but right. also help them, you know, uh, learn a little bit more about their disease and hopefully, you know, uh, help them take care, better care of their lung disease. Right. Now, Dr. Chen, what about the patients, um, as you know, mm -hmm. that are on oxygen and they may not be able to exercise because of the fact that they need too much oxygen? So how 
can it help patients like that? Yeah. So that's, uh, that's actually an important point. So as you know, either uh, for some patients who have you know, uh, more severe lung disease, or if they have a combination of, of both lung disease and pulmonary hypertension together, um, oftentimes it, uh, this, the, the main problem that these people are experiencing actually is a, a very significant severe drop in their oxygen levels every time they, become, uh, they try to be active or, or exercise. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, at, at pulmonary rehabilitation facilities, they basically um, are equipped to essentially g uh, provide as much oxygen as, as a patient might need and certainly at much higher flow rates that usually um, are, it would be practical to, to maintain at home. So that could be one of the reasons why, you know, particularly patients with more severe lung disease uh, might be better off starting an, an exercise attempt, you know, through pulmonary rehabilitation. So Dr. Chen, let's talk about viewers that are watching um, who already, they already have, you know, uh, sarcoidosis, pulmonary sarcoidosis, <laughs> but then they have sarcoidosis affecting other organs right. of the body. How do those patients benefit from any type of exercise when they have it throughout? Right. So just like how pulmonary rehabilitation is, is addressing, you know, the, I guess the largest group of patients with sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. since sarcoidosis typically affects uh, the lung in, uh, in most patients. Um, there's certainly other forms of physical therapy programs uh, that might be appropriate depending on how the, uh, depending on the patient situation. So, for example, uh, cardiac rehabilitation, uh, our sister program, essentially um, is uh, designed to help patients with, um, who have significant heart disease, maybe in this case from uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, and also there are certainly very, some very good neurorehabilitation programs, again, uh, for patients who may have you know, um, experience or incur some neurological impairments from neurosarcoidosis. And then, you know, not necessarily because of one specific disease or, or, or manifestation, but there's certainly some um, patients who simply have a lot of more problems with their, simply their balance. Um, and maybe for some of those uh, patients, it may be good for them to just at least participate in a standard physical therapy program you know, address their balance issues first, and, and then they could probably have a better um, experience with one of the more specialized physical therapy programs, be it pulmonary or cardiac rehabilitation. Well, I'm glad the viewers um, like you breaking that information down because I'm sure that it's a lot more viewers out there who would like to exercise or benefit from a program and right. just didn't know what the benefits are. Um, the other uh, concern or question that I have, when people are going through these programs and all the programs sound really great. Does this mean, Dr. Chen, that in order to be functional in mm -hmm. our lives with pulmonary sarcoidosis, that we have to have therapy or, you know, have the pulmonary rehabilitation just to live our lives normal? Right. Well, no, not exactly. <laughs> the rest of our lives, you right. know? Right. <laughs> um, well, I, maybe I'll maybe try to explain it this okay. way. Um, so, you know, one way to look at this issue would be that um, even though we want patients to remain active and exercise regularly, um, you know, a lot, another, again, another goal of, of these programs is really to improve, like, essentially self-maintenance of the lung disease or, or whatever the, the main problem of, that they may have. Another issue that kind of comes up, unfortunately, would be uh, probably to try to understand how I hate to say it, how insurance companies, particularly Medicare, view the, uh, these uh, physical therapy programs. So um, for, for Medicare, specifically Medicare's um, view of poor rehabilitation currently is that, um, you know, Medicare actually sets a lifetime limit as to how much uh, poor rehabilitation they will cover. So currently I think it's uh, maybe two sets of sessions, essentially. So because Medicare sets a, a, essentially a limit and since many insurance companies will kind of follow Medicare's lead on, on setting these lifetime limits, um, we, we then have to recognize that pulmonary rehabilitation is not necessarily going to be there forever for patients. So since if we know that, you know, uh, that the, the time that each patient has with pulmonary rehabilitation is, is essentially kind of limited, then, you know, it kind of brings us back to the main goal of pulmonary rehab, which is um, basically to get patients back on their feet, improve their exercise tolerance with the exercise program, um, but also very importantly to, um, again, you know, teach them uh, how to take better care of their lung disease. Um, 
and again, you know, uh, hopefully this will, uh, you know, um, lead to, um, uh, you know, a better opportunity to kind of reinforce a lot of these, um, you know, health promoting lifestyle changes that we know are important uh, for patients to continue to lead their lives, uh, hopefully, you know, with the best quality of life that they can have. Um, so essentially, you know, some of it, it, it unfortunately kind of gets back down to coverage for some of these services. But I, I think that um, with, enough, with the proper monitoring and encouragement, um, you know, particularly since patients um, do spend about 12 weeks uh, through pulmonary rehabilitation, that hopefully this will be a, a, a good way to kind of reinforce these, you know, health promoting, um, you know, lifestyle changes that we think are important. Okay, so I'm going to play devil's advocate. <laughs> I'm a patient with pulmonary sarcoidosis. I complete this 12-week program for pulmonary rehabilitation. Right. And after that, I am still not feeling well. I cannot exercise. What do I do? Right. So, you know, that's always, that's always an important issue. So. On the one hand, even though we, we do anticipate that most patients will, will benefit from pulmonary rehabilitation, uh, we do know that some patients still don't feel well for whatever reason. Um, it's, it's important, though, that we remember that pulmonary rehabilitation um, doesn't re replace regular medical care, meaning that even during, um, you know, during um, patients' uh, participation um, in pulmonary rehabilitation, they should continue uh, their regular follow visits with their regular doctor. Um, and so, you know, so hopefully what um, they can catch then, if the patient, you know, as the week, a few weeks pass, and the patient, if the patient's really not making any progress with uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, then it'll be uh, important to kind of start looking for other possible reasons as to why this might be. Um, and that would include looking for other medical problems such as pulmonary hypertension, mm -hmm. something that could accompany um, or, or also uh, complicate certain cases of lung disease, maybe even looking for sleep apnea or, or even diabetes in some cases, you know, other factors that uh, can certainly make a person feel unwell. Um, yeah, I mean, the other thing to kind of think about also is that, uh, you know, in some situations, you know, the tests may show that the person, uh, the patient may be actually receiving enough treatment uh, so that their sarcoidosis may seem to be under control, yet they're still not feeling well. And so, you know, as doctors, we all accept uh, that we don't fully understand why some patients uh, don't feel well, particularly in that last case where the sarcoidosis seems to be under control and patients still not, are not feeling well. And even after looking for other pos possible medical reasons. Um, so actually, you know, um, you know, trying to understand wh what the full impact that sarcoidosis may have on, on patients' quality of life is actually the focus of a, of a research project sponsored by the, um, the FSR, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Um, and it's actually an active study that's uh, still looking for patients um, uh, at, at, at eight centers throughout the United States, including Johns Hopkins. I was just about to ask you that, how can patients find out more about the research? And you did mention um, FSR, but uh, mentioned the eight other institutions you said that Oh, well, so, so certainly FSR is one right. place where, um, you know, some active research projects focused on sarcoidosis may be posted. Another place would be the National Institutes of Health and the NIH website. Um, there aren't, compared to some other diseases, there may not mm -hmm. be as many clinical trials, but the website clinicaltrials.org might be another place um, okay. because they're often listed there as well. Um, but you know, if you were, if a patient were to simply contact a local sarcoidosis uh, clinic, right. uh, such as the one at Hopkins, they they may also be aware of whether, um, you know, whether what, what other uh, you know, uh, research studies may be active, and it may not be necessary that the per they contact the, the very local one. You know, most of the sarcoidosis clinics, um, you know, have some communication with other centers and may be able to direct them a patient who calls them from somewhere else, what the resources might be close to where they are. And that's good because I know our viewers, they're from all over, you know, it's right. global. And they may not know where the resources are for uh, research and things of that nature. But I wanted to kind of go back a little bit mm -hmm. for the new viewers that could be watching. Sure. And they don't know who Dr. Chen is other than, you know, the, the title that we put up. So if you don't mind just letting them know exactly what you do 
at Johns Hopkins um, oh. Clinic. Oh, sure. So at, at Johns Hopkins, um, m many physicians who uh, have the opportunity to practice there, uh, including myself, we, we often end up dividing our time between, I guess, the two broad categories, patient care and usually some form of research, research and or teaching. Um, so in my case, I, I, I probably spend approximately maybe half of my time related with patient care, either uh, by helping uh, with the sarcoidosis clinic um, in terms of outpatient patient care, uh, and then also um, helping out with inpatient um, the, the inpatient pulmonary services, which includes the intensive care units. Um, when I'm not directly involved with patient care, then it would be um, spending time uh, trying to make progress with some of the research projects. Um, a lot of them, uh, most of the, the research I'm involved with is related with sarcoidosis, um, either um, clini uh, clinically based, like uh, this question that we sort of, uh, sort of like mentioned before, mm -hmm. how does sarcoidosis um, impact patients' lives? Um, but also trying to understand the immunology, the, you know, what exactly is, is really happening um, biologically to patients. We think that they're probably related to each other, that the, bio right. the biology, you know, the, the disease process probably has a big uh, impact as, as to why the patients are feeling that way. Okay. And hopefully we can bring those two, you know, uh, areas of, of, of investigation closer together. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a little time just to elaborate on the um, immunology of it and, you know, how it actually makes people feel with sarcoidosis? Well, uh, uh, I don't, so as we had mentioned before, sarcoidosis does involve inflammation, mm -hmm. you know, which means that when we think that sarcoidosis, when we say that sarcoidosis is active, the immune system is, is, is active uh, and it shows its activities in a, in a few different ways. One is that the cells of the immune system, namely white blood cells. Um, they, if you take them from a patient with, um, a patient with active sarcoidosis, they, uh, these white blood cells show a, an activated profile, so to speak. They um, will express certain genes, they will do certain things um, that white blood cells who are, that aren't active um, won't do. And some of this activity includes movement of the cells. So most white blood cells are sort of circulating in the bloodstream sort of like waiting for th something to happen. Wow. Um, if the, if, but if, if the event is something that causes sarcoidosis, then what will happen is that the white blood cells come out of the bloodstream, find their way uh, into an organ that's typically involved with sarcoidosis, like, like the lung, and um, these white blood cells will, will then also assemble themselves into these clusters, you know. Um, yeah, and these, it's these clusters that we call granulomas. So the granulomas themselves can cause problems depending on what organ they where they are, how many of them there are. Um, you know, if they're in the lung and they, if they distort or you know um, irritate the lung enough, patients may experience you know cough, maybe a sensation of shortness of breath, um, and uh, if it's bad enough, it can actually lead to damage to the lung. And we think it's this damage to the lung that eventually can cause scarring. So depending on how long the sarcoidosis is left active or how vigorous it is, that could lead again to lung injury and, and, and scarring. Um, so it's easy to sort of think about how sarcoidosis can directly cause symptoms related to organ irritation, mm. damage, that kind of thing. Um, but some symptoms aren't necessary because the sarcoidosis is in the lung, you know. Um, and those are maybe some of the more common things that people experience, you know. Uh, the fatigue, um, maybe aches and pains, uh, fevers, sweats, and even weight loss. So those symptoms are not necessarily unique to sarcoidosis. Um, these symptoms can, can come about uh, essentially in many different diseases whenever the immune system is very active. Mm -hmm. you know? And so even a severe allergy um, event might cause a person to feel worn out, aches and pains, maybe fevers even. Um, so we think a lot of these less like mild specific symptoms might be because of, um, or actually, we, we know that some of these symptoms are caused by chemical signals that the immune system uses, okay. like essentially like danger signals. Wow. Why? And so that could be um, one of the danger signals. One of these chemical signals called tumor necrosis factor, sometimes referred to by its initials TNF. So TNF um, we know is a chemical signal that 
it does a number of things. It does stimulate the immune system, you know, it activates mm -hmm. white blood cells. It's an important chem chemical signal and probably one of the signals necessary for these granulomas to form, you know, activate white blood cells, get them out of the bloodstream and assemble into granulomas. Um, but we also know that tumor necrosis factor, um, if you were to inject it into somebody, will immediately cause fevers, fatigue, aches and pains, you know, and so, Again, these are symptoms that are seen in patients with sarcoidosis. Okay. The symptoms are not unique to sarcoidosis. Um, and tumor necrosis factor also, this chemical signal, is not unique to sarcoidosis. It's just part of this danger, set of danger signals that the immune system uses to kind of raise awareness, you know, right. um, activate the immune system. So what this, what, this, what this explanation is leading to is that because we've sort of seeing that tumor necrosis factor, even though it's not unique to sarcoidosis, um, that TNF plays an important role to stimulate the immune system um, and support and, and cause granulomas to form. This is one of the reasons why some of these newer medications that block TNF, mm -hmm. these anti-TNF agents, anti-tumor necrosis factor medications, why we think that these medications would be very useful in sarcoidosis. Uh, based on these biological reasons. Right. Now, I say that uh, the way I, 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 I sta stated that, that we think that they should, uh, that anti-TNF agents should be very useful in sarcoidosis, the reason why I said it that way is that um, there haven't, hasn't been enough research to, uh, to get um, FDA approval for these medications for sarcoidosis. Okay. And part of the issue would be to, uh, is that, you know, it, it, it takes resources, sure. money, time to do these proper, you know, types of research studies. And because um, sarcoidosis is not as common, say, as rheumatoid arthritis and some of these much more common in, in immune diseases, there hasn't been enough attention and resources devoted to study these drugs for sarcoidosis. So these drugs exist. They're FDA approved to treat rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Crohn's disease, psoriasis, a number of uh, other autoimmune diseases, each of which probably have 100 times more patients with, with, right. with those diseases than sarcoidosis. And unfortunately, what we're left with is a drug that we think would be very important for sarcoidosis, uh, but maybe out of reach because of um, coverage limitations. Well, I hope yeah. that they will one day, <laughs> you know, fix that so we can see what that drug can do to help people with sarcoidosis. Right. Uh, Dr. Chen, I want to thank you once again for taking out time of your busy schedule to lend your expertise to our viewers. Um, I appreciate it and so do they. And again, as my viewers are looking at the show today, I always say stay positive, live your life, and just, you know, stay uh, stress-free. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Be blessed.